Today I'm planning to talk about war and peace. And this comes up because of a question that was asked earlier in the week at a teaching. Um, someone was um, wondering, is there ever an appropriate time for Buddhists to take up arms when there is a very serious threat, brutal aggression? How do we respond? And of course, the Buddha said that there is no time for taking up the ability and the willingness to kill. So what do we do? And I realize this is a pretty heavy topic and also that you have a lot of other things going on in your life. Um, mom with the broken wrist and moving and you know all kinds of things happening. And yet these situations are always in the background for, for us, whether we give it much conscious attention or not. Um, since we're not experiencing that right now here in our day-to-day -day life, maybe it seems far away, but it's actually always <coughs> possible that it comes to our own door. And then what would we do? So uh, there have been a number of times when people have asked me, you know, how can um, a Buddhist country like Myanmar have so much violence and aggression, um, problems like that. And I, and I say, well, whoever is doing that, they're not following the Buddha's teachings. And of course, there's no religion anywhere, or any country that kind of thinks of itself as following a certain religion where people are also not following the religion. <laughs> so, you know, you have you have that um, as part of the, the reality of this world. This is a, this is a, a realm of mixed karma. There is the dark and light. There is greed, hatred, and delusion. And as long as that's here, we have these kinds of situations where people are aggressive, brutal, um, immoral, following greed and hatred, and, and really deluded. So, of course, as we study the Buddha's teachings and we take it up and we practice, and even you don't have to be Buddhist to deal with this situation differently. Um, you know, as many of you know, we just started meeting at the Quaker Center here locally. And they have signs all over the place. War is not the answer. And when you look at it from the Buddhist perspective and you begin to understand karma and begin to understand that violence comes in cycles and that there are results even if we think, oh, we won, we vanquished that oppressor and we won. It doesn't end there ever. It keeps going. It comes back again. And it's it's and it comes back again personally based on our own part in it. And so this is why even when there's a very um, horrible threat, the individual decision needs to be around what karma are we wanting to accept? How do we want to handle it? And, uh, and a lot of times there are many more options than we think. Um, 
the stories that we are told from the time we are come into this world um, about the the hero. Think about what our who who is set up as a hero in our culture, not just the culture in in America or in the West, but the culture all over the world. You know, we have this this story about the times when violence is justified and the people who engage in it are glorified. And yet in reality, what happens to us when we do that? What happens in the world when we do that? So all the major religions, as far as I know, have some statement like the Buddhas that said, hatred never puts an end to hatred, only love can do that. And how do you bring love into a situation where there's so much brutality? How do you respond in a way that puts, in, puts a stop on that brutality without becoming brutal ourselves? So this is a question, of course, that people have been asking forever and coming up with various approaches. So there is a, a book um, that I read. At that time, it was entitled, Is There No Other Way? Um, by <coughs> Michael Nagler, who was a professor at UC Berkeley who taught nonviolence and meditation, and he was promoting uh, the um, philosophy that Mahatma Gandhi used. And this book later released as, uh, I think, The Search for a Nonviolent Future, really chronicles many of the ways in which people have resisted peacefully and had a huge impact on whatever is happening at the time. So understanding um, the results of our actions is part of what we do as, as Buddhist practitioners, trying to see into the future enough to realize what the result is. What's the result when I, you know, speak harshly to someone? What's the result when I speak kindly to someone? What's the result if my actions have a mind of ill will or hatred behind them? How does that affect me? How does it affect others? And the Buddha was obviously really clear he there were there were absolutely no instances of him saying well in this case it's okay to kill another person or, or a living being so there's total clarity about this and many of you know the the simile of the saw where the buddha talks about how sometimes people appear to be gentle but then when under pressure they're not. And to really look at how much pressure we're willing to or capable of withstanding in this way. And then at the end of this whole story about this lady who was actually not very kind at all underneath the surface. Um, and he taught, the Buddha talked about, you know, really holding a standard, a high standard. And he used the simile of the saw saying, even if bandits come along and they're sawing off your arms and legs, if a thought of hatred arises in your mind, you're not following my teachings. And, you know, it's like, really? <laughs> that is, that is a, a pretty high standard. Um, but the beauty of it is that it's, it's completely clear that what we need to address is our fear and hatred. 
and what we need to address in the world when we're confronted with these things is how can I do my best to stop the violence without becoming violent, without any wish to harm someone else. Now, I believe that if we really had this as our fundamental goal, um, I don't expect this to ever happen, but as a nation, what if we had that as our fundamental goal? I think we could come up with credible um, ingenuity around how to stop people who are doing harm without killing them. It doesn't mean they wouldn't get hurt in some way, um, hopefully a recoverable way, but without hatred, without vengeance. And you can really, like, we can know in our own mind the difference between how it feels to be wanting to harm someone versus seeing the problem, knowing it's unwholesome, knowing it's horrible, and knowing that there's suffering there and delusion. It's an illness, really. I think of it as, you know, <laughs> Earth, you might think of it, okay, maybe some people see life on planet Earth as um, a playground. You know, here you can follow your desires. Um, gratify your senses or they oftentimes people think of it as a school here we're here to learn lessons but you might even think of it as a hospital what do what do we need to recover from um, that we wind up in a realm where there's so much mixed karma and can we um, actually do what's healing and help help each other also, so I think that there are um, some potential pitfalls in bringing this message forward because we're not in a war zone. I'm not experiencing this right now. I look at what's happening in Ukraine and I really admire the courage that I've heard about from the Ukrainians. And I'm sorry that they have to be in this situation. And it's not like there's any thought of condemning those, those who are fighting back. But there's a sadness for the karma that they incur in the process. And a hope that, you know, you have a group like the Quakers who for hundreds of years have stood for nonviolence, helping the slaves escape through the Underground Railroad. And, you know, I think probably being a very strong force in the the kind of idea of conscientious objection. So in America, if people are drafted, if your religion requires that you not kill, you don't have to go to the service, that there is another way. But then how do we help further what's good and put a stop to what's harmful? How do we contribute to that? And there are a lot of ways. Um, reading Michael Nagler's books um, can really be helpful to understand it. And I'm sure there are many other sources describing this. And some of you may have heard this story before. I um, took my mom when she was, um, well, she lived, lived maybe another year after this trip. I took her back to where she grew up and it's also the area where I grew up and she wanted to see the places where she had lived and the schools where she had gone and all those kinds of things and 
and there are many relatives there. You know, one night, my eldest cousin invited us over to his house, and the, there was a big surprise. All of the cousins and their partners were there for my mom to see after years of being in California, away from everyone back in the in in Indiana and Illinois. And um, it was interesting because my cousins and my um, my cousins' husbands were all growing up in that era like of the Vietnam War, and many of them went to the service, and they told their stories. One of my cousins was wounded, um, and. <laughs> One of the husbands, his name's Harry, he told the most amazing story. He said that he had enlisted kind of at the last minute um, before getting drafted, which gave him more options of what he could do with his um, military career, you might say. And he decided to become a paratrooper. So he was one of the guys who would be flown over the war zone and dropped somewhere to fight. And he didn't want to. And they were taking a, uh, all these men over on a boat. So you have a, a couple of weeks to really think about what's going to happen. And he said, he kept thinking about how he didn't want to kill anyone. He's a very, very devout Christian. He kept thinking that he didn't want to kill anyone. And he thought, with God, all things are possible. And so he gets to Vietnam and he is sent out on, you know, the first mission, of course, really nervous, um, jumping out of this plane into this mountaintop. And he said the way they always did these missions is they drop men on three different mountaintops. And the other two mountaintops, when they came back, there had been a lot of fighting. And where he was, there was no fighting at all. They didn't even see anyone. And then it happened again. The next time they went out. The other two places, lots of fighting. Even though it was a different mountain, <laughs> there's still no fighting where Harry was. And this happened over and over and over and over for dozens of missions. And he was even in this, um, in this camp, in this place for longer than the normal tour of duty and still never saw action. And new, new men would come in and they'd be nervous. And then someone would say, hey, stick with him. Stick with Harry, you'll be okay. And, uh, then there came a point uh, where a new commander was assigned to this, this base. And um, he said, because of my coming, I'm gonna, gonna do something nice for you all, or I'm gonna do something nice here. I'm gonna give the person who's been here the longest an early leave, they can go home. And the person who'd been there the longest was Harry. And the men, over 200 men signed a petition. You can't take Harry. We need him. He's our good luck. <laughs> um, yeah, but actually he was shipped off home. And it just makes you think what's possible with enough conviction. What can we do? to make a difference. I mean, how much difference did it make? At least he didn't have to kill anyone. But what if we all thought like that? Or many of us? But I don't want to ignore the fact that sometimes we're put under a kind of pressure and we make decisions and we take the karma. This is not to be overly idealistic or condemning of anyone. 
in the choices that they make, but to care for each other, like to care for those men and women who fight and come back with that in their mind. And to care for um, young people who are facing this world and doing what we can to help them see alternatives. So I'm going to leave leave it at that. Um, and I'm depending on your questions and comments to really flesh this out um, as you wish. So thank you. Yes, Paula and Phil. Um, so my question is, what if uh, someone is threatening your life? Um, you're in a life-threatening situation. They're, you're, it's a self-protection, whatever they call it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. do, you know, similarly, the saw, that's, he's just talking about cutting off arms and legs. Obviously, that's life-threatening. You can um, maybe not have ill will to that per towards that person, but do you protect yourself? Yeah. I think that's do. the biggest question I have. Yes. Yes. Self-protection is fine. Um, I was just talking with a, a very uh, learned Buddhist about this uh, the other day. And he said, I don't care about the house. I don't care if this is my land. That means nothing to me. I'm going to try to run, <laughs> you know, avoid. Avoidance is a reasonable tactic. <laughs> Uh, if it's something like that, you know, like he's like, I'm not going to defend my home. It's not mine anyway. Um, but I will, you know, uh, get away if I can get away. It's also okay to fight back. It's okay to try to stop someone, but not, but to try not to kill them. It's like, it's okay. Um, you know, if you, if you hit them, if you throw something at them, just try not to do it in a way that's going to really, you know, like just, just stop them. Um, if you need to turn the fire extinguisher on them or whatever, you know, but not with a, not with a mind of harming, just a mind of stopping them. And if you can stop someone that helps them too, in a way, you know, they they don't get to follow through on their bad intentions. So yeah, it's okay to defend yourself, but try hard not to really do long-term damage, you know? It takes a lot of preparation. And I think about the monks who were and nuns who were tortured um, in in prisons, and they I've heard that uh, under, under a lot of um, testing later, um, when they were they were focused on maintaining their compassion. That's what they said was the the most important thing. They didn't want to lose their compassion. And when they were doing that afterwards, uh, with all the kind of investigation into how they were, no PTSD. You know, so, but it's, it's something we can do to train ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Kate? Yeah, thank you. I I so much appreciate your remarks and raising this up as a topic. It's something that I've thought about a lot um, over my lifetime um, because 
I was a practicing Quaker um, for most of it. Um, and I'm still on the books as being a Quaker, whatever that, whatever that means. And this testimony, the peace testimony um, in Quakerism is, as you said, is it's, it's like, it's pretty much the only article of faith, and, I, and that's not belief, maybe. It's pretty much the only belief in Quakerism um, that, that I'm aware of. And it's one that I've, um, to be very honest, I've struggled with too. Um, what if someone were about to kill my child? You know, or something like that. And, and thankfully, you know, these are hypothetical questions. And at least for me, they're hypothetical questions. Nobody has tried to kill my child. And so I haven't been put in that situation, but it doesn't prevent me from reflecting on it and situations like it. And when I came into Buddhism about 20 years ago, I still carried this question with me. And I came across um, this distinction that you make between um, ill will and um, anger and hatred, and then committing an act of violence. And on the other hand, you know, not coming from a place of ill will or hatred and still, and then deciding to take on the karma, I think is absolutely crucial. And I came across a story in a Mahayana Sutta that you probably know of about the pirate. Um, and the pirate, um, so the story, the story is that, um, there are 50 bodhisattvas on a ship. This is, of course, a Mahayana story and a thief, a pirate. And the captain of the ship reads the mind of the pirate and sees that he's going to kill the 50 bodhisattvas so he can take the ship. And to prevent this, the captain kills the thief as it's the only way to prevent this from happening. Or well, that's what the story says. And the story concludes that, you know, the motivation for the captain's act was compassion so that the thief would not suffer the bad karma of killing the 50 bodhisattvas. And, you know, I often, I wonder about that. Um, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any answers. And, you know, I don't suppose I ever will unless I was in the situation of being the captain or something like that. But I don't know, this is a very, I think this not coming from a place of anger is really critical. So there's another piece that's really critical. And I'm glad that you, you know, brought this forward, because this is one of the reasons that we really here at KDV are dedicated to early Buddhist teachings because the Buddha would not agree with that story. Yeah. And the reason is because the Buddha really understood kama. You don't take on this kama of killing, knowing about kama. You wouldn't touch it ever. There's nothing worth breaking those five precepts or those first four for sure. If you understand kama, you'd rather die. You'd rather anyone die than take on that, that kama. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like death isn't so such a big deal. We're all going to die anyway. Even if someone was going to kill my child, of course, I would react. I would try to stop that. I would put myself in front of that bullet or whatever it is. Like those teachers in schools can just taking in the reality that when you're a teacher in school in America these days, you really are faced with this possibility. And when you understand Kama, you know that if I'm not an Arahant, there's going to be another round. And this is going to come back. And like I said before, violence comes in cycles. You see, you see the movie and the movie ends, you know, there's this evil that happens 
the hero kills the the perpetrator and then the movie is happily ever after it's there's no happily ever after after that it comes back it comes back in very real ways that person's people that person's brother that person's whatever not only that it's in your mind this heinous act is in your mind there's this there's no happily ever after there and this is sangsara we're never going to sort it out here <laughs> it's never going to be peace on earth because of greed hatred and delusion so it's better to die than to kill if someone comes along and robs you and kills you that's their problem it's not your problem if your mind is pure you go to that purity there's no other way only if you believe in rebirth i'm sorry what paula oh, sorry i didn't know i was unmuted I said, <laughs> only if you believe in rebirth well that's a good, I'm glad. <laughs> I don't know who unmuted you, but <laughs> yeah. Well, if you understand karma, you understand rebirth. No doubt about it. But see, we fall into these dilemmas before we understand karma. Mm -hmm. And once we understand karma, there are no dilemmas around this. Thank you. I really appreciate that clarification and that um, that perspective, distinguishing the Mahayana from the um, from the Theravadan teachings. And you also have to distinguish some of the Theravadan, Theravadan teachings from the Mah not from Mahayana, but from early texts, because Theravada yeah. has also added a bunch of stuff after yeah. the Buddha's time. And whenever it's useful, this is not to condemn, you know, all of the the stories and the things that have come after, but we have to look at whether they accord with what the Buddha actually taught or not. If they accord with what the Buddha actually taught, they can be helpful. So just to, just to be clear that every tradition has this um, kind of, what I wanna say, commentarial creep. It creeps in, it gets bigger. <laughs> So, so it's up to us to really pay attention to the scholarship that verifies um, what the Buddha actually taught. And, and there's tremendous confidence in it because of the, the evidence we have. So there's evidence at the, the scriptural uh, kind of scholarly level, and there's evidence in the heart for those who are developing on the path. We, we have a a growing sense as we develop of what is the truth. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome, Kate. Linda. Yeah, I I also really appreciated your comments. Um, the question the question I have is how to where does intention enter into this, and and. Um, I was thinking about about self protection, and um, if the intent is really to to stop it, but in the process um, you end up killing. Intention has a really big part because it reflects the the level of purity in the mind, and that's hugely important. So our intention. And we can't, we don't, we want to be sure we're honest about this and not just like covering something over. Um, you know, you really want to get rid of some pest and you, you put the poison there saying, oh, it's going to deter them, but actually it kills them. And at some level, you know that. So, you know, it's like you want, you have to be clear. And, and we have to be honest, but the intention really matters. And even in the Vinaya, when, um, you know, it, if, a, if a monk or a nun 
intentionally kills another person, they can't be a monk or a nun anymore. You're so far away from the holy life at that point. You're not living in accordance with the Dhamma. But if you accidentally kill someone, it's not an offense because you didn't intend it. And the intention is a huge part of it. So, you know, it's, it's really, um, really work with the mind. It comes back to, you know, me uh, in Thailand, I was mopping the floor on, by hand and I sweep my hand through this area. And I see after my hand is swept through that I killed a spider. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm not being careful enough, slow enough, um, you know, looking carefully enough and it happened that I had an opportunity to um, meet with Ajahn Liam and he asked if I had questions and I thought well this is like Buddhism 101 you know like the, but this is the question in my mind so I asked him and he said you have to look at your intention that's where it counts so is my intention to go fast so I don't see the bugs? That would be a bad intention. <laughs> you know, is my intention just focused on I'm going to get the floor clean? It's not my intention to hurt anything. So the purity of the mind, really, what is purity of the mind? When is your mind pure? When your mind is full of metta or compassion or equanimity or appreciative joy, there's no room in there for bad intentions towards anyone or anything. If we really understand karma, we know that that's the most important. Having that pure mind is more important than whatever else we might try to achieve. But it, it, it's in your examples, it's clear but to me in the example of where you where say self-defense mm -hmm. there is some desire to use some amount of force um, mm -hmm. to, to stop whatever you know the assault or whatever is going on um, so there there is a certain energy i would imagine in in that direction so I, I, I guess. Look at the example the Buddha gave to King. Oh, Prince, Prince, somebody. <clears throat> I'm forgetting his name. But the Buddha said he had this baby laying in his lap. You might know this story. And the Buddha, the, the prince was talking to the Buddha about saying things that are harsh. And the, and the Buddha said, if this child were to get hold of something and get it stuck in its mouth, what would you do? You would, you know, he, he said what he would, the prince said what he would do. And if he couldn't get the, the thing out of his mouth, he'd dig in with his fingers and he'd pull it out. Even if he drew blood, he'd get that out, right? We gotta have that same kind of intention. He's not gonna use the kind of force that's gonna suffocate the child. He's going to use the kind of force that really helps to relieve this. I mean, we've got at least one physician here. You have to do something. Sometimes you have to inflict a certain amount of pain, but it's not your intention to inflict pain. You're, you're fixing the situation. If we can really keep that kind of purity, what does it take? It takes letting go of this attachment even to my own body. We have to let go of the attachment to whatever this perpetrator is going to be damaging it's a it's a tall order i get it <laughs> but this is where we're headed with, with the practice and we have to be willing to go there we have to be willing to head in that direction thank you welcome karen Hi, 
I don't really think I have a question, but I just kind of wanted to make a comment about how um, <clears throat> in my own practice, <clears throat> excuse me, once I sort of embraced rebirth and karma, karma is an ongoing process because I find Buddhist teachings around it are so complex and his, his ideas around karma are, they're not so linear and straightforward like everybody else's teachings and easy to grasp. Yeah. Uh, you know, so a work in progress, but once I sort of embrace them, like I don't even think it's a matter of debate anymore. <laughs> I feel like it's the ultimate truth. So um, it starts to inform your decisions. I can't say I've ever been in a situation where I felt like I was going to lose my life and I had to make decisions around that. So at this point, I don't know how I'd react. But I do know that in other very important decisions, I think about that now. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, my God, I might get a bad rebirth. Like, oh, mm -hmm. God. You know, and... Um, yeah, I remember watching this movie with a friend and we both agreed that we would rather die than have to live in this world that was being depicted on screen. And some other people there were like, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. And we're like, no, like if you did what some of these people are doing, you'd have such bad rebirths, like it wouldn't be worth it. And um, yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of say that, that it kind of like just changed my perspective so much that yeah. I started to think beyond this moment, this life that, oh, I could end up in you know, some realm that mm -hmm. I might be stuck in for how long just by doing some bad, really bad act. So that yeah. was just my, my comment. But I am curious from your perspective, if someone doesn't believe in rebirth and karma, how do you practice this path? Like, it must be <laughs> That's a really good question, Karen. I, it mystifies me actually how people can feel they've taken on the Buddhist teachings and they don't they don't understand karma and rebirth or they don't trust the Buddha enough to believe that what he reported is true. Yeah. <laughs> And also the start right on the path. It's a start just to get there. And then you work on these. Things. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that people should accept things just purely on faith. The Buddha didn't want that. And I, I don't think that's a, the, the thing either. The thing is um, to look at what we know to be true and to really, we know it through our direct experience. We know what, the, what it's like to be harboring anger and hatred or to be cultivating love and kindness. We know, we know that that has an effect on our future. It has an effect on our present moment. It has an effect on the way the mind is developing. We know that. We can verify that ourselves here and now. The Buddha talked about this. There's a sutta where someone asks, what are the visible fruits here and now? And he gives a whole list of situations where we can see that right here. We don't even have to, in that sense, we don't even have to think about rebirth. If I kill someone, I've got that on my mind. No matter what I think, I could be conditioned by this myth of redemptive violence forever, which is we all have been in our fairy tales, in the cartoons, in the movies, and everything. But I know that that's not where it ends. I know that that's going to be on my mind. And so this is, this is another reason why it's important. Even if, we, even if we did that, there's a way to purify the mind after that. As long as we're still alive but that doesn't mean do it it's like this is hard work <laughs> purifying the mind after something like that um and you know it's there is a path to spiritual recovery even if it's not in this lifetime in future lifetimes but you know so it's like this is not about condemning anyone this is about understanding the natural results of our actions, our mental actions, our speech, and our physical actions. There are results to this. Things get created out of our actions. And we, 
we have the task of recovering from those things and avoiding those things and learning how to take make other choices. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Olivia? Yeah, I have some kind of nitty gritty questions, but they've been coming up sort of similar to your cleaning and the spider question. Um, what is our, well, I guess I'll just say my feeling first. Um, sometimes like we get ants in the house or <laughs> other pests and I'm fine with it. Like it just doesn't bother me. Like they come and then like the cold weather comes and they go and, you know, or if there's a food source, you move it. Um, sometimes my husband wants to put down poison and I express my opinion, um, but I don't, you know, I could like completely stop him. Like I would have the ability to kind of lay down the law and just say no, but I also don't know if that is my duty or my place, like to stop someone else because I, I believe that it's their karma if they choose to do that. However, I feel like I feel guilty. Like I feel like there's a part of it that's me. If I had the ability to stop it, it does feel like it's partly mine. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a similar I, similar question around paying other people to do. Like I don't think I could do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Paying someone to exterminate you know, kill yeah. animals or to me, that still feels bad. Like that doesn't really feel like it's not my, I mean, maybe it's not my hands, but it still feels like my karma. So those, those were two cases um, that I, that I wondered about. And then the third one is um, well, like when I'm, sometimes I'll sweep up the um, spider webs and there are like uh, egg sacs Mm -hmm. I don't know what the like like where the point of life is like if there is an egg sac you know do you have to carefully kind of move that to a new location or is that considered like not life yet um yeah I know these are nitty-gritty but it's sort of just they've come up for me recently because we've been doing a lot of cleaning and I I think the real the best answer is look at what would clear your mind mm. look at how you can because there's no pat answer here that's gonna like you know um that's gonna serve you for the rest of your life what will serve you for the rest of your life is figuring this out mm -hmm. and what does it mean to figure it out it's like we keep reminding ourselves that living beings want to live and they don't want to be harmed. Just like me. And we look at that and then we look at the situation and we decide what to do. And don't forget the power of like chanting and blessing and talking to living beings. Mm -hmm. I know a number of people talk to the living, you got the ants coming in and then you talk to them and they go away. And if, heard lots of stories like this but then maybe they don't and it's like it is up to us individually to really dig into what is it that I can do with a pure heart or what can I do to purify the heart and then how can I approach this from that place and I think you're totally right. Is there some underlying, yeah, wish my husband would put out the poison. <laughs> like, I'm not saying there is that, but sometimes the mind can be very sneaky. Defilements can be very sneaky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we want to really go, okay, what's really going on in here? Do I really want to smash that mosquito that's sucking my blood? Uh, Ayachitanan has this way of just watching it. Okay, you go ahead, honey. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't hurt. I mean, 
we don't have malaria here um, as far as we know, you know, or whatever, but you know, it's like, this is an inside job. That's what Ajahn Liam said. Look at the, look at your mind, you know, be interested in and concerned for and cultivate the purity of the mind. The real deep down, you know, as practitioners, we have to look carefully at what's really deep down in our mind and uproot those underlying tendencies to greed, hatred, and delusion, to the delusion of self. What am I protecting? What is that going to bring? This process is, in this form, going to come to an end. <laughs> but it's getting closer. <laughs> but it's okay. Yeah, I can um, see the how even me like asking you for these like really detailed rules is like kind of like looking for an out or like mm -hmm. you know and it's like if I know this isn't feeling good that's enough right like I don't yeah I, I mean just follow that yeah yeah we we want to be we want to be continuing to investigate inside to know the shadows of and and to cultivate those activities like like chanting i mean you know there's this chant that in our in our chanting books for this tradition um you know all beings two-footed four-footed many-footed you know um all creeping things all flying things all whatever i love you i am full of metta for you please go away <laughs> 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 you know, um, yeah, you might leave that spider sack there, um, or maybe you can gently remove it to somewhere else. But what is going on in the mind? Is right. there kindness? Um, um, yeah. Can I ask another question? I don't know. Mm -hmm. if I'm sure. Um, I still feel sad and yeah, like remorse for when I was in science and part of in science, we worked with animals, um, mice. Um, I definitely didn't like it at the time. And there was like very not, there was not bad intention. Like I, I would talk to the mice and be like mm -hmm. really sweet with them and everything, but we still had to kill. And yeah. Um, you know, I feel like I know that once you've acknowledged doing wrong and resolved never to do it again, like that, that is, the, you know, but I still feel, I guess I still feel like the comma playing out just in my like periodic sadness or like some dreams. Yeah. So, so what's helpful probably is um, make some merit and dedicate it to those living beings. And this is, this is a very potent and positive approach to the things that we've done in the past. So we've all done stuff, um, but we need to let it go. The more we hang on to it, the more we perpetuate that karma. Mm. Ajahn Ganha said, this is important. This is not just, you know, me suffering by myself here. Um, we we want to recover from those experiences by bringing in more metta, more karuna, more generosity. Um, those, those living beings died at that time and they've probably gone through 30 rebirths since, you know, or something. And so, you know, really share that merit with them and may they, may they be uplifted by that. Mm. Okay, that's really lovely. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Cynthia? Yeah, you're on mute. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, Olivia, for your questions, because I struggle with a lot of that same stuff. So my question is, and I, I know there's a great deal of controversy about this and disagreement in the Buddhist world, but what about killing and causing suffering to animals for food? And I know one of the arguments for the monastics is, well, you live on alms, you have to eat, you know, what's offered you, but that doesn't apply for us lay folks. And I just, yeah. it baffles me. It baffles me that people can say they're following the first precept and they're causing terrible suffering to animals and killing them. I just, just interested in your take on that. Yeah. Well, to, just to be clear, I mean, of course you've probably heard me say this before. And if you've been reading the Buddhist teachings, you'd know this. It's, it's like Cynthia said, it's not really against the first precept to eat meat because it's a different karma. And we would know that really right away if we had to go kill that animal ourselves. Any of you, I think, would have that experience of, ooh, I want to do this. And, you know, growing up on a farm, you're kind of like taught to kill. And many people have that experience. And, you know, it's such a relief it was such a relief to me to find out that I didn't have to eat meat to be healthy. So I've been a vegetarian since 1981. And we have a vegetarian monastery. And there are vegetarian monasteries. Um, Ajahn Gunha's monastery is a vegetarian monastery. And so there's a teaching there to, hey, um, we could either eat no meat or much less meat. But there are situations when people live where that isn't enough to really sustain them. They don't have the protein available mm -hmm. that we have available. So, you know, it's, it's great if you're um, in an affluent society with a lot of options, but if you're not, um, it's, it's bad for the person who's doing it. The Buddha said, don't be a butcher. It's a wrong livelihood, you know, but if you're paying the butcher for the meat, that's not so great either. <laughs> so, the, so the rule of thumb is be conscientious about why you're doing it. If we're eating for pleasure or are we eating because you happen to have a condition in your body that needs to have a certain amount of that kind of protein. Just know why you're doing it and do it as little as possible. And, and, and that's really the way to a pure mind around this. If we're just like not caring at all, not looking at all where our food comes from, there's a whole area of blind blindness there. And, you know, it's also, it's also, there's some blindness with the, the very staunch position on the other side of it to, to, I've, I've met some really militant vegetarians, uh, cruel on, in, the, on their own side, you know, and, and that's not, appropriate either so we can really look at our own choices around this and our own behaviors and 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 our own mind you know am i eating this conscious of where it comes from and and who is suffering as a result and there's always suffering we live in this world food and food preparation causes a stress on the earth it causes you know there there's a lot that goes into it that there is suffering involved you know and so we want to eat in a way that's respectful of that but we still have to eat because we're here with the human body <clears throat> so 
So that, that's what I would say. Kindness all around. And again, you know, it's like, try to avoid taking up the worst of the karma. It's like, yeah, don't, don't take up being a butcher as your life So how, how is, I mean, a, a lot of what you're saying makes total sense. I mean, I, I certainly don't fault Tibetans who live up where they can't grow anything and people that have medical conditions, but how what is everybody else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but how is um what you say don't be a butcher i mean that that's part of something that's not livelihood but how is eating meat that someone else is butchered different from paying a hitman to kill somebody you're pissed off at i mean i'm that's, a, oh. I, that's an honest question how is it different <clears throat> yeah if you i mean that's a very good question um you know if it does make a difference if you have that intention of wanting this animal to die. Again, it comes back to the purity of the mind. The intention is important. Am I, am I eating this because I wanted this animal to die? And it, I mean, there's a kind of hatred, ill will, disregard, something's there if I want this animal to die. Have you ever seen someone kill with happiness, with glee? I have. Mm. And then you really get the sense of joy being a karmic intensifier. It's way worse if we do bad things with joy. It's way better if we do good things with joy. It's a karmic intensifier. So the karma is different. If you're like, you know, I'm just dragging, my body is craving. I mean, I know someone, my body is craving liverwurst and I hate liverwurst. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like at that level and they eat it and they go, oh, God, I hope I never have to eat that again. But the body is getting what it needs. So, you know, like, there are a lot of different situations that we can find yeah. ourselves in as human beings. And we have to be generous with each other around those things, but conscientious and caring. And if we're really bringing love to the fore for everybody and everything, then we have to make these decisions. And it really does, and it really does shade the karma one way or another. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Paula and Phil. Talked about cycles of violence, which has always seemed true to me. So I don't think it just seems self evidence that you say. Uh, what What are the karmic implication karma implications of now I'm having more free time and uh, not doing what I can to mute the coming next cycle of violence. You don't have to dial it down to. There's no karmic violence. implication of that. Um, you're not. You're not making karma by not doing anything. I mean, yeah. you know, if it if it's in your mind that you should be doing something, then maybe there is something you could do. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, but. I know there's this, this story, I think in the Vinia, maybe like someone falls in the, in the river and they're getting floating down and drowning and the monk doesn't get up to help. It's, it's not, he hasn't committed an offense. Yeah. Especially if the monk can't swim. I mean, could be any kind of reasons. Right. But yeah. the point is it's not the same thing as like, wanting someone to die or right. pushing them off the bridge or, you know, like any of that, you know, there's none of that. And there's none of the, you know, like if you, if you choose to not do that, that's not a problem. That's not a karmic problem. But if you have that wish in your heart to do something, then maybe you find something to do that suits your, your situation, your stage of life, 
um, you know, uh, there's the making of good karma. You know, I mean, I'm sure that for those people who have jumped into the river and pulled someone out, there's an incredible feeling of happiness for that. And so we're not required, but just weigh it up. You know, <laughs> like, okay. what do you want to do with your time? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. You're welcome. You want to meditate for uh, 13 minutes? <laughs> Actually, sometimes short meditations are really valuable. So let's settle in. Find a comfortable position. Invite the body to relax. And in order to help the mind settle, especially after reflecting on such serious matters, we can really invite a, a thought or two of gratitude. We can be grateful that right now we're safe. Right now, we don't have any immediate choice before us that requires all of that discernment. And we can be grateful that we have this opportunity to really hear the Dhamma, reflect on the Buddha's teachings, all of his encouragement to live from a place of generosity and kindness, to have wisdom, to know without doubt what's good and what's bad, what's wholesome and what's unwholesome, to never cover over the unwholesome as if it was all right, to see it for what it is and to see the beauty of this life for what it is. To bring love into our heart, loving kindness, without attachment to things, to bring compassion forward in our heart, in our mind, for all living beings. And to bring equanimity to the mind. kind of wise acceptance. This is how it is. This is the nature of samsara. There's the, the good and the bad, the light and dark. And we have this beautiful opportunity to increase the light in our own lives, in our own minds.
There are a thousand ways that we can be pulled off into the wrong direction. Irritation over anything that comes along. Hatred, animosity, jealousy, anger, fear. But there is also a thousand ways to incline towards what's good. Truth, the Dhamma, the beautiful generosity of the Buddha and of the people around us. We all live based on the kindness and generosity of others, every one of us. That's how we survive. That's how we live. That's how we flourish. That's how we grow. We train ourselves to see things as they really are, accept that reality, and cultivate the good in our own mind. And then that naturally overflows into our speech and into our actions, into our decisions, into the direction of our development. This is how we <clears throat> rebuild our character. How we pave the, the way to our next existence. And ultimately to Nibbana. <clears throat> Not a place, but a realization, a deep understanding and knowing that puts the end to all questions, to all doubts. And what remains? Kindness. The Buddha called it the highest happiness. Peace.
Yes, Neil. Um, so your answer to Phil's question kind of took me aback. And so I'm wondering, you say, if you don't take any action, there's no comma. But if somebody, fall, if somebody falls into a river and you see that they're drowning and you think, I mean, intention plays a part, doesn't it? You think to yourself, well, I never really liked them. So I'll just, <laughs> let, I'll just let them drown. That, this there's is trauma true. in that, isn't there? There, there definitely is. This okay. is true, Neil. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, I kind of have the image of the monk sitting in meditation and maybe either doesn't realize or just has the, the firm understanding that everybody dies and it's okay enough, but no ill will at all. None. No um no negative attitude in the mind because there is karma there yeah and what if we catch it it comes up you know like these negative feelings come up but then we see them as they are thoughts or thoughts feelings or feelings this is old comes from the past and we reject it The Buddha said, you have those thoughts of cruelty, ill will, sensual desire, and you reject them. Don't tolerate them. And that's where, that's where the karma comes in. Yeah. 